All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Indigenous Voices online workshop. I am Jackie Zamuto, the US Program Manager here at WITNESS. And this workshop is being co-hosted by WITNESS, Seventh Generation Fund, and Sandra Creamer Consulting. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody in just a moment. But before we get started, I want to go over a few logistics for this webinar. So one second. Um, first off, your mic sh and your camera should be off. But if not, please double check and turn those off so that we can make sure the focus is on the presenters. If you have any tech issues or questions, you can send us a message in the chat box or send an email to feedback at witness.org. Our colleagues Dalila and Ali will be monitoring those spaces and available to help. So let us know if you're having any issues. Um, we do have some time set aside for a Q&A at the end, so feel free to send us your questions throughout the duration of the webinar. Again, you can use the chat box for that or email us at feedback at witness.org. We are gonna be recording this webinar and posting it in our resource library. So you'll be able to access it um, in the coming days. Uh, we'll also send a follow-up email with a link to the presentation and the video examples that we talk about in the campaigns that we mentioned. I do want to note that because bandwidth issues can make it challenging to stream videos during a webinar, we're only going to be discussing the videos, not actually showing them. Um, but we will send the links to everything afterwards. So don't fear if you want to watch them, you will have them. Um, and once we wrap up, you'll have an opportunity to fill out an evaluation. We'd love to hear from you and how we can strengthen our work. So please fill that out if you have time. And as for what we're going to cover in this workshop today, after the introductions, I'll share an overview of our video advocacy methodology, and then we'll get into best practices for filming, along with a few digital security tips and equipment recommendations. We should have a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. And now I'm honored to introduce Sandra Creamer, who's going to welcome us with a prayer and talk a little bit about her work and the Seventh Generation Fund. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Thank you very much, Jackie. My name's Sandra Prima. I'm a one-year Calpidoon from, uh, from Australia. And I'd like to, um, first of all, uh, say a prayer and give acknowledge, and then I'll go on. I'd like to acknowledge the land that we're on at the moment, the Indigenous peoples who own this land, and give acknowledge to the circle that we're in at the, at the moment. I'd also like to give thanks to our, to the, to the universe and to our Mother Earth for where we are here today as Indigenous peoples. We're grateful for what our Mother Earth has given us and we're also grateful for the strong spirit that she has blessed us with. Because as Indigenous people, that strong spirit gives us the strength that we need to keep going on in our work that we do all around the world. I'd also like to pray, put praise forward to uh, all Indigenous peoples who are in the world, who are out there today, battling their issues and who are either in some sort of struggle or who are walking alone or who need guidance. I pray that our ancestors will be with them and to give them strength to continually protect them in their battles and to continually lift them up in the world that we're in. I'd also like to give thanks to us as Indigenous people to make progress for where we are in, in our lives and in this world. As Indigenous peoples, there are 350 million of us. We are one of the largest um, human rights movements in the world and our ancestors are continually with us to protect us. I give blessings to all of you on this day and I hope that, and I also um, want to make sure that and ask our ancestors and the universe that today goes well. Thank you. I'd like to just give a little background on how this all came about. I actually had done a program uh, training about four years ago with WITNESS and I felt that Indigenous peoples were not able to, didn't know how to video record and um, needed to have strength when they're giving evidence and advocacy in, in our works for what we do today. Because as we know, a video cam recorder can really 
be the foundation for us when we need any sort of facts against any of our violations of human rights. So I called Jackie and Jackie from Witness, she said yes. And so then Seventh Generation, who I'm an affiliate with, they are our co-sponsors. Seventh Generation, as we know, is based in California and they have affiliates all around uh, North America as well as some based around in Africa and the Pacific. They cannot be here today with us, but I'd like to acknowledge the support that they continually give myself and witness so that we can be that voice for Indigenous peoples in this world to be able to deliver what they want to do. This can also help you advocate because generally someone else is being our voice. As Indigenous people, we need to raise our voices continually and we need to be able to get the message out ourselves. We need to know how to, we, it is us who are the ones who are being violated and it is us who needs to get our own messages out because we are the ones who walk the walk and we need to be able to talk that talk. So today, I hope that from this that you'll be able to learn and I also hope that you can fill out our survey. It'll really help myself and Jackie identify anything that you need as Indigenous people to support you and help you to move forward when, if we do another, another webinar. We, this is the first webinar that we've done and we hope to continue to do more webinars around the world involving more Indigenous peoples. So if we'd like to begin, Jackie, and again, thank you all very much for coming on and supporting us in this really great moment. I can't thank all of you enough for who have registered and who are on here. It is really empowering for myself and seventh generation that we have Indigenous peoples out there supporting these new sort of alternative ways that we would like to teach you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sandra. It has been a pleasure working with you and I am looking forward to what we can continue to do together. Um, so I also want to introduce my colleague, Polly Makam, who is working on the US program with me and she will be co-presenting as well today. Um, to get started, a little bit about WITNESS. We are an international organization that trains and equips human rights defenders to use video for advocacy and evidence. And I want to note that even though Polly and I focus our work on the United States, we have colleagues and partners working with human rights defenders all over the world. And it's worth noting that this presentation is geared towards Native American audiences, but we've included examples from around the globe, and this information can be adapted for different regions and contexts. Also, WITNESS has been around for over 25 years, and in that time we've collaborated with many indigenous-led organizations and communities on a wide variety of issues. However, in no way are we claiming to be experts on indigenous rights, and we are always learning and adapting our trainings and strategies. So again, we really welcome your feedback and ideas. What we wanna focus on for the first part of this webinar is WITNESS's video advocacy methodology. WITNESS defines video advocacy as effectively using the power of stories, visual evidence, and personal testimony to move people to act and create change in human rights law, policy, practice, and behavior. Now keep in mind that video is not a magic wand. Video advocacy works best when used strategically and is something to complement other organizing tactics like petitions, marches, lawsuits, etc. I wanna start out by highlighting a few different ways that indigenous activists and others are using video advocacy in their work. So the first one I'm gonna point out is using video to counter or juxtapose narratives. As we've seen time and time again, testimony and stories from indigenous activists and people of color are often ignored, discredited, or dismissed. But we've seen how powerful video can be to expose violence and counter these mainstream narratives and juxtapose false statements from authority figures or others. In this example we see on the slide from Standing Rock, there's a quote from the sheriff's spokesman who says no water cannons were deployed against activists at Standing Rock in November of 2016. And right next to that, we see a photo or a still from drone footage that shows that water cannons are being aimed directly at activists. So this juxtaposition received widespread media coverage and exposed some of the harsh tactics that were being used against the water protectors. 
And we're not gonna get into drone footage today, but Polly will touch on some practical tips for filming abuse in just a little bit. And we'll also share a link to a report that we put out around the use of drones at Standing Rock. I also wanna highlight the use of video to educate. Um, the stills that you can see in this uh, slide are from a documentary called First Light that was done by the Upstander Project. The film documents the tragic impacts of the boarding schools, foster care, and adoption programs that many Native American children were and still are forced into. The stories you hear in the video are from participants of the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And this video is the precursor to a feature length film coming out called Dawnland that's going to be released in just a couple weeks. And given that most of the schools in the United States do not educate our youth on Native American history or what they do receive is very whitewashed, films like this are crucial. They've, and to further educate their audiences, this film has a website that provides a list of additional resources and reading materials. And the next one I'll point out is pressure. So the stills that you see here are from a, a video that was co-produced by the Endorise people, who are indigenous nomadic pastors who lived for centuries in Kenya's Central Rift Valley. In 1973, the Endorise were evicted from their land, denied access to their homes, their grazing lands, and spiritual and healing sites. Their homelands were turned into a wildlife reserve and a major tourist destination. Eventually, the tribe brought their case to the High Court of Kenya, and it was thrown out in 2002. In 2003, they brought a claim to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. And to support that claim, Witness worked with the Center for Minority Rights and Endorise Welfare Council to co-produce a nine minute video that was submitted as evidence. The video was used to pressure decision makers by proving the Endorise were indigenous people and the eviction violated their rights by visually showing the challenges and poor living conditions on the new land where they were relocated, and by helping to frame core arguments in an efficient and accessible manner, making it easier for judges and commissioners to get a visual sense of the case rather than going through massive stacks of paperwork. Of course, the video also helped bring the voices and testimonies of the Endorise directly into the courtroom. In 2009, the commission issued a groundbreaking decision finding the government of Kenya guilty. In the video, this video and other videos have continued to serve the Endorise as a useful tool for education, empowerment, and a preservation of their cultural history. And if you can hear horns outside, that's because we are located in Brooklyn and there's a very noisy street below us. So I hope you enjoy that little addition. <laughs> um, for the video that was submitted as evidence, Witness worked with the tribe and campaign partners to develop a clear video advocacy strategy, which is what we're gonna get into right now. So the main components of our advocacy strategy are advocacy goal, target audiences, message, story, strategic distribution, impact assessment, and preservation. We don't have time to cover all of these day today, but we are gonna to touch on most of them. So it's important to start about start out thinking about your advocacy objective and to establish the purpose of the video within a broader advocacy strategy. SMART objectives are not just about making sure your goals are intelligent. It's an acronym for a set of criteria to help people define goals and objectives. So what you wanna do is make sure your objective is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. This is a helpful framework to ensure that you're not setting yourself up for failure by having an overly broad or poorly defined goal. So here's an example of a not so smart objective. Empower indigenous communities to do environmental accountability research in the US. To make it a little smarter, we reframed it as, provide technical support to tribal councils or indigenous led environmental organizations for three years to help document corporate violations of environmental laws on tribal lands and place this evidence before national stakeholders, including, and you can fill it out from there. Well, this is a mouthful, uh, but you can see that adding more specifics about what empowerment means, for who, and for how long make our goal a lot clearer and a lot smarter. So moving on to target audiences. Video advocacy is audience driven. What does this mean? It means that your entire video needs to be targeted to your audience because you want to do something, you want them to do something to help you achieve your goal. 
So first you need to figure out who that audience is. Are they politicians, judges, tribal council, journalists, students, etc.? Consider who has the influence and power over your goal. What is their perspective or attitude on this issue? What steps do you need to shift their attitude? All of this is going to affect how you convey your message and produce your video. Also remember to consider both primary and secondary audiences. Secondary audiences are those with influence on your primary audience and might help you be able to reach them. We also like to remind people not to get carried away with numbers or high profile visibility. Sometimes reaching a group of 10 key decision makers is more effective than reaching 10,000 of the general public. We like to say to people that it's less about how many eyes see your video and more about which eyes see it. That said, it's not a bad thing to try getting your message out to a lot of people. It all depends on what your objective is. So to talk a little more about audiences, I wanna share an example from a project we collaborated on in Mexico with an indigenous community known as the Hubawahim. This is a very simplified version of the case and we will share additional documentation, but we needed to keep it short. So in 2011, the Hubawahim community learned that 80% of their land had been granted to two mining companies. The community was not informed, consulted, and obviously did not consent to this majorly destructive land grab. All of this happened despite the fact that indigenous tribes in Mexico are guaranteed the right to consultation in the Mexican constitution, in the convention 169 from the International Labor Organization, which is a UN agency, and the American Convention on Human Rights, which Mexico has signed on to. On the other hand, the right to consultation is not recognized under Mexican mining laws, even though this goes against international human rights standards. So in 2013, the group began working with a local legal collective and they filed a legal challenge to the federal government stating that the mining law was unconstitutional. One of the ways the government pushed back was by claiming the Hubawahin were not an indigenous community and the government was not obligated to consult with them. In 2015, right before the case went to the Supreme Court, the two mining companies withdrew their bids and proposals to mine the land. They were clearly scared that they weren't going to win. This benefited about 240 indigenous communities in addition to the Hubawahin. It was a major win. And then in 2017, a judge granted a historic injunction that will help prevent future mining land grabs in the region. It essentially forced the Mexican Ministry of Economy to comply with constitutional and conventional obligations to indigenous peoples. So how did video play a role in all of this? And who were the target audiences? Well, around 2013, community members began collaborating with a group of media activists, including some witness staff and allies, and began to develop a strategy for using video to support legal and advocacy efforts. Through community meetings, participatory workshops, and media trainings, the group developed a clear strategy for how to maximize the use of video and how to target multiple audiences. The first video they made was targeted, at the, was targeted at the Supreme Court judge overseeing the case. The video was focused on proving that the Hubawahin were indigenous through showing their traditional lifestyle, ways of farming, native language, and customs. They also articulated how the mining project would destroy their land and livelihood, and that the lack of consultation violated their basic rights. There was very minimal dissemination of this video because they wanted to focus their efforts on reaching the proper legal audiences. Then they made a second video, which was released in 2017. This one was aimed at communicating the legal success after the mining companies backed out and the judge granted the historic injunction. This video was much shorter and intended for sharing across social media channels among their allies and partners. It was also utilized in various media reports. And the third video is currently being worked on. It's not out yet, but it will be about 40 minutes long. And this one is intended to share the group's legal and media strategies with other communities facing similar threats. If you watch these videos, you'll notice that a lot of the same footage is repurposed. This is a great tactic when you have limited capacity or budget, but again, it really works best when you have a clear strategy so you can ensure that you get all the shots you need while you are filming. And now we're at strategic messaging. This is crucial because here's where you clarify exactly what points you want the audience to walk away with and what you're asking them to do. 
A few things to consider. Are you trying to educate, engage, or activate your audience? What framing and approach or what voices and visuals will move and convince your audience? Be clear about your call to action. Do you want your audience to sign a petition, to vote for legislation, or to attend a march? And more importantly, how are you going to ask your audience to take action in a compelling way that will resonate with them? And this brings us to storytelling. So I like to think of strategic messaging as what you're asking your audience to do, and the story is more about how you are asking them. So of course there's no one right way to tell a story, but there are some important elements that can be useful to consider before picking up the camera. The first one is structure. How will you organize your video? Will it be a linear narrative with a beginning, middle, and end? Or will you break out of that traditional mold? And how will you present and relay the information in a way that makes sense to your viewers? It's also important to think about the style. This is more the look and feel of your video. Will it have fast-paced editing, energetic music, or flashy graphics like on MTV or Vice? Or will your audience respond better to a more formal style like something on PBS or CNN? Thinking about how your audience will view your video can also impact the style. For example, is it going to be shared with a small group of people in a private setting or will it be posted on Facebook? If you're creating videos for social media, here's a few specific storytelling considerations that you might want to keep in mind. It's helpful to start your video with a powerful image or statement. Viewers get easily distracted and you want to capture their attention immediately. Also, get into the content as soon as possible. If you have a three minute video and spend 30 seconds at the beginning with titles and logos, you're probably gonna lose your audience. And the statistics are always changing about the best length for a video, but generally shorter is better for social media. It's good to aim for about two to three minutes or less. It's also recommended to add text or closed captions. This is really helpful because so many people view videos with their sound turned off. And adding captions makes the video more accessible to anyone who's hard of hearing. When you're sharing your video on Facebook or any online platform, it's also important to include additional context or links in the description so people can learn more or immediately take action. It's also a good idea to try and use a clear and catchy title as well as hashtags or tagging other supporters, partners, and allies to help you get the message out. This will also help ensure your video is easier to find by supporters, investigators, or the media. And moving on to audiovisual elements. This is about what do you want your audience to see and hear? Will you include interviews, text, narration, music, or B-roll? And for those unfamiliar with the term B-roll, it's essentially adding additional contextualizing footage that can help you establish a sense of place or give a deeper sense of an interviewee's life or experiences. Here we see images in B-roll from a video about Jamie Lynn Butler, a young Navajo girl from Arizona. Jamie is part of a campaign called the Trust Campaign, which has taken legal action in all 50 states and across the US and against the federal government to hold our leaders accountable for their collective failure to protect our atmosphere for current and future generations. It's a massive campaign. <laughs> um, to support the campaign, Witness produced 10 videos featuring youth from different states describing the impact that climate change is having on them, their family, and their community. Three of the plaintiffs featured in the videos, including Jamie, are indigenous youth. The videos were submitted alongside the state lawsuits to, again, to take the judges away from these huge stacks of documents and complicated scientific reports and to present them with a human story from youth who are directly impacted by climate change. In Jamie's video, we hear her talking about having to sell her horse because of limited water on the reservation. We hear her talking about her fears for her family and her people. We hear the wind and we hear the water. And through B-roll, we see Jamie tending to the animals, fishing with her mom, and writing a letter to President Obama. These shots visually communicate a lot about her and make it more engaging for the audience to watch something other than a talking head in an interview. 
The lawsuits that these videos were created for have had varying degrees of success at the state level, but the federal lawsuit, which is 21 youth plaintiffs suing the U.S. government, is moving forward and gaining momentum. Last month, a judge rejected the Trump administration's attempts to avoid the trial, and now they're waiting for a court date to be set. This case is being called one of the most important cases in the United States. The videos of the youth were just one tactic among many used by the campaign organizers. The videos have gone on to win awards at film festivals, be used by the media, and in educational programs around the country, helping to inspire other children to raise their voices against climate change. And that brings us to the last component of storytelling, voices. Who will tell your story? Do you want to tell your story through interviews with people, through text, through a narrator? Do you need to include an emotional voice that will tug at your viewer's heartstrings? Or what about an analytical one that supports the facts, like a scientist, academic, or issue expert? Maybe you need a political voice that your audience trusts and can be influenced by. It's also important to consider what voices need to be included for ethical reasons. Are the people most directly affected given space to speak out? Are you honoring the dignity and agency of those that you're working with? I want to touch on ethical representation just a bit more. Um, as a human rights organization, our work is rooted in the human rights principle of do no harm. So it's not just about what voices you will include, but how you will protect them. Do the people in your video have safety and security concerns? Have they given informed consent? And do they have a clear understanding of what your video is about and where it will be shown? Have you discussed possible repercussions with them? And are the questions that you are asking framed in a way to empower survivors rather than re-victimize them? Additionally, if you're including other footage that you did not shoot, how can you be sure that's verified? And are you giving appropriate credit and context to that work? And I'll stop it there. This leads us nicely into our next section. And Polly is going to share some practical tips for safely and effectively filming for advocacy and evidence. Thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I have a cold that I'm getting through, so I might be sniffling and clearing my throat throughout this. But I appreciate you all bearing with me. So now that we've broken down what video advocacy is and covered some strategy, we're going to spend the rest of the webinar focusing on documentation, specifically tactical tips and strategies for filming human rights abuses. So witnesses trainings and resources in the US are generally geared towards filming law enforcement, so police officers and immigration and customs agents. But the tactics and tips that we'll be discussing can easily translate to filming abuses by corporate or private security forces, white supremacists, counter protesters, or any other adversaries that we wanna to try to expose and hold accountable. As a first step, it's really important to know and understand your rights in order to make educated decisions about what, what you should or shouldn't do in an incident involving law enforcement. We cannot do that without first addressing and acknowledging that the US Constitution is a colonial document that was written by colonizers. However, understanding this framework can help you to protect yourself. We all know that what is the law and what actually happens in the real world are not always aligned. Knowing your rights and vocalizing your rights might not be able to stop the abuse in the moment, but can be helpful down the line. So I just want to keep in mind that this is the lens with which we're talking about quote unquote rights and constitutional rights as we go forward. In the United States, it is illegal to film law enforcement or public law enforcement in public or publicly visible spaces. This means if you're in your apartment or, or your home and you see law enforcement harassing someone on the street from your window, you still have the legal right to film them. It's reasonable for people to assume a lack of privacy when they're in public spaces. So if someone is attending a protest or rally, it's reasonable to assume that you can film them without securing their consent. For example, if there's a counter protester at a rally who's harassing people or spewing hateful chants and messages, it's within your rights to film them. In terms of audio recordings, different states have different laws. Each state is either a one or a two party consent state. A two party consent state requires consent from all parties involved before someone can record, record audio. A one party consent state means that you do not need the consent of the other person in order to record their audio, so long as you are a party to the conversation. And finding out if, you're, if your state is one or two party consent is really easy. You can just do a quick Google search. 
It's also important to film openly and obviously. We don't recommend trying to record secretly from your pocket or making sudden movements to grab your phone from your pocket. These types of motions could escalate violence and we've all unfortunately seen how ridiculously easy it is for law enforcement to mistake common everyday objects for, for weapons in the hands of civilians, especially when in the hands of black and brown people. Also important to understand, law enforcement cannot search your phone without a warrant or consent, but they might do it anyway. This is why it's so important that we take steps to protect our phones and the content on our phones. So the easiest way to protect information on your phone is with a password. And the strongest password that you can have for your phone is a six digit numeric code. Not a four digit code, not the face ID or pattern lock, and definitely not the touch ID. The reason we warn against the touch ID is because one, someone could just grab your finger and force you to open your phone. And two, in the US under the Fifth Amendment, you're protected from giving up information that might incriminate you, including passwords and PIN numbers. But Touch ID is not considered a password under this definition and therefore is not protected by that amendment. So a six digit numeric code is gonna be the strongest password you can have on your phone to encrypt it and protect your content. You might wanna also encrypt you might want to also consider using an encrypted messenger service like Signal or WhatsApp. When it comes to protecting your digital security, it's difficult to give any sort of prescriptive answer about what you should or shouldn't do because it really depends on who you are and your specific risk profile, but these two ten services tend to be the most secure. They both have end-to-end -end encryption, meaning messages that you send are not saved on any database or server. And so if the company were to get subpoenaed by the government or police, they still couldn't access the content of your messages. Also, Signal offers a disappearing messages option, which means that you can set your phone to delete incoming messages after a certain period of time. If you are, a high, if you are in a high-risk situation, services off before sharing tweets, Facebook posts, Instagrams, etc. in order to protect your privacy and safety and the privacy and safety of others. Enabling auto backup on your phone so that your content is automatically saved to a server like the cloud can also be a good idea. If your phone is lost or damaged or confiscating, confiscated by enabling auto backup, you can still have access to potentially important photos or videos that you've taken. In a world of fake news where the stories of marginalized people are always being discredited or questioned, being able to prove that your footage is real is so important. You wanna film your content in a way that verifies that you were where you said you were when you said you were there. Some of the ways you can do this is by filming context. So landmarks, street signs, any other identifying marks that prove your location. When I'm at a protest and I'm filming, I try to always get a shot where I film the protest in the background and the street signs in the foreground or vice versa. Or I'll film the street signs and then do a slow steady pan to the action. These are some of the ways that we can contextualize what we're filming. It's also important to establish the time and date that you're filming. You can do this in a few different ways. You can state the time and date on camera if you're comfortable, or you can film a newspaper or clock or just film the home screen of someone's smartphone so you can see the date and time. It can also be really helpful to film and take note of other cameras in the vicinity, specifically surveillance cameras or even news cameras. If necessary, these cameras can offer another angle of the incident that you're filming and potentially even help corroborate your footage or testimony. But while you are trying to establish context and location, you wanna be thoughtful about potentially exposing, exposing personal information about someone. So if you're filming outside someone's home, you wanna to try to avoid getting their address or license plates because our role is never to expose our community members. Our role is to expose the people violating our rights. And if it's totally impossible to avoid filming someone's personal information, there are ways to blur that information later, but I'll talk about it in a little bit. I just wanted to show, I just wanted to show a few examples of context that you can film in order to help prove your footage is real. So looking at this photo, I can tell immediately that the picture was taken in Washington Square Park in Lower Manhattan in New York City because of the landmark in the background, which is the arch. So this is a great example of how landmarks can help contextualize and verify content. If possible, it can also be helpful to get an overview shot. This one wasn't actually taken with the drone, even though it looks like it. It was taken from the roof of an apartment overlooking Washington Square Park in New York City. And it offers even more context than the last image because now you can see the Empire State Building in the background, which is another New York City landmark. And it helps further establish the context, including the direction the image was captured from. 
Capturing footage that shows the location of the sun or moon on the horizon can help indicate the time of day. Any clouds or lack thereof can also give more information about weather on that particular day. This can be really helpful in rural situations or campsites or places that there aren't a lot of distinguished landmarks. All of these things help add an extra layer of verification to your footage that help prove its authenticity. There are over 500 hours of footage that get uploaded to YouTube every minute, and we know that investigators, lawyers, and journalists look through this footage for documentation of incidents and abuses. The footage that gets used the most is the footage that has context and shows important details about what happened. So it's really important to show as many details as you can when you're documenting an incident. When you're filming law enforcement, details like license plates, how many officers are present, weapons they're holding, gear they're wearing, these are all crucial to telling the story of what happened. Badge numbers can obviously be helpful, but we've heard from a number of partners that they can be difficult to capture in a heated or tense situation where people are moving a lot or there's violence, and so it might not be the safest to get close enough to, to film those numbers. One thing you can do in a situation like this is read the numbers out loud on camera instead of trying to stabilize your camera long enough to film the badges. Documenting after an incident or after the perpetrators have left can also be really helpful. You can film any damage or destruction they may have caused and write down details in addition to what you capture on camera. When filming, you want to try to hold your shots for at least 10 seconds. It might feel uncomfortable at first or like too much time, but again, if you're filming something for evidentiary or advocacy purposes, people will need to be able to really see what's happening in the footage, and the longer you hold on the action before panning to the next shot, the better someone can make out the details. It's best to film the entire location continuously. You want to try to move the camera slowly when you change your position or when you zoom in or out, and avoid faster jerky movements. When possible, use a tripod, monopod, or even just a surface to stabilize the camera. I've personally filmed entire speeches and concerts on my cell phone just by resting my filming arm on the shoulder of a friend. So there are plenty of creative ways to stabilize your camera. Also, work with a friend or a team when you can. That way you can cover more ground and get more angles of an incident in a safe way. Some other helpful ways to show an incident and details are by filming a very slow 360 pan to provide context and show what's happening from multiple angles. Wide establishing shots can help provide an easily understandable layout of an incident or scene. A wide shot can also assist in verifying time and date, time, date, and location by providing more information in the frame. Medium shots help to establish the location of the evidence in the scene and the relationship of one piece of evidence to another. For example, in this shot, you can now see that the water is being sprayed at least nearby where people are standing. And close-up shots help to show key details and identify people at a scene. So in this close-up shot, it becomes really clear that the water is being sprayed directly onto protesters. So all of these different shots together help to provide context and tell a story. Narration can be a really useful tool to add context to your footage as well. It can be especially helpful if you're filming from far away or across the street and can't capture everything you want to in a safe way from a close distance. The most helpful narration from a legal perspective is fact-based and unbiased. So try to stick to the facts, think like a reporter. Saying things like, I'm at the corner of Fulton Street and Portland Avenue, it's 4.45 p.m. in the afternoon, a police officer appears to be questioning a woman across the street, things like that, really sticking to the facts in the description. It's really important to remember not to allege anything about a person's immigration status or, status or criminal history in your video. We don't want to give any information away that could potentially be used against the, the person we're hoping to protect or ourselves. If violence does occur, Try to stay quiet because lawyers or journalists or whoever you're working with will need to hear what's happening in that moment. At a training I did recently on filming law enforcement, one of the participants pointed out that because Ramsey Orta remained quiet when he filmed cell phone video of Eric Garner being killed by Staten Island police, the world now knows and remembers his important and powerful last words when he told officers, I can't breathe. I thought this was just a really poignant and powerful example of why remaining quiet can hold so much importance, not just from a legal perspective, but a human one. Lastly, we generally advise people not to capture witness testimony on camera after an incident. 
We've heard from lawyers that recorded testimonies are harder to edit or recant later than, test than written testimony is. If you interview someone immediately after they've been involved in an incident, they also might say things in the heat of the moment that they don't want recorded. Live streaming is a tool that a lot of activists we work with utilize. It can be a great way to amplify a message or action and to create solidarity and connect with people who aren't present at the action. However, there are a lot of security risks and challenges with live streaming. If you live stream a protest or an action, there's a high risk of exposing people's identities. It's safe to assume at this point that law enforcement watches live streams, especially for highly publicized or contentious events. So earlier I talked about wanting to be thoughtful about exposing someone's personal information. But when you live stream, you don't have time to think through safety and security precautions because things are unfolding in real time. But if after considering potential security risks, you still decide live streaming is appropriate, you may wanna consider broadcasting to a private channel of just trusted allies or lawyers instead of sharing publicly. You might also wanna consider using a separate device to live stream. For example, if someone in the community has a phone they can donate, you or your organization could reset the phone so it doesn't have any personal information on it and just use it to live stream and film. You also wanna think, you also wanna be thinking about your audience and how to engage them before, during, and after a live stream. It can be helpful to work with a partner, someone who can monitor the chat and comments and also help with technical issues. Try to think like a, sp a sports commentator, using factual description to talk about what's happening, repeating essential, every, essential information every 10 minutes or so in case new people join the live stream can also be helpful. And if you don't feel comfortable speaking on camera, remember that you can still engage your community by typing into the comments. And just last thing on this, always remember to download and save a copy of your live stream. Don't just rely on Facebook to keep your live stream. We've seen people's live streams get deleted from social media apps way too many times. So we've talked about the types of shots you can film, like landmarks, in order to add context to your footage. We also talked about important details to capture that help tell the story. But equally important to understanding the story is how you actually present the footage. Cell phone footage and surveillance footage can be difficult for an audience to understand. Even if you did film with context and you held your shot steady for 10 seconds, it can still be challenging. The footage might be grainy, there might be a lot of people in the crowd or a lot of movement, all of which can make it difficult for an audience to understand what's happening. But there are little things you can do to present your footage in a more clear way that tells the story after you've filmed. So I wanted to show you all this really basic example of what you can do to present your footage in a clearer way. The image on the slide is of a, of a police officer confiscating a tribal drum at a Standing Rock protest. It may have been really clear what was happening to the folks who were present, but can be difficult for others to see and understand what the officer is holding in his hand. So in addition to adding a caption and description, this person also highlighted the object being confiscated by drawing a simple red circle. Drawing a circle, pausing on footage, or adding text into the footage in order to highlight what's happening are really helpful and easy tactics. But please remember that if you make edits to your footage, always do so from a copy and keep the original unedited and stored in a safe place. Editing original footage hurts your, hurts your chances of being able to use it in a court case. So now that we've talked about filming and documenting, we're going to talk a little bit about what you do after you film because how you share and store your footage can really affect the impact that you make. So first things first, after you film, take a deep breath and pause. We live in an instantaneous society with a 24 hour news cycle where it can sometimes feel imperative to share content immediately and often. When filming for human rights, accountability and justice, immediacy is not the goal. Making an impact in a safe and ethical way is the goal. So always remember to pause, and think through your strategy, your safety, and your options before you go ahead and share your footage publicly. The very first thing you wanna do after you film is try to share your footage with the person or the family of the person who was targeted or, or arrested. They should be the ones who decide what to do with the footage, fully recognizing that they might decide they don't wanna do anything with it at all. And as allies and advocates, that's something we need to respect. Images and videos of human rights abuses can be re-traumatizing for the person or the family of the person who experienced it. This photo right here is of a close friend of Mike Brown Jr. As everyone knows, Mike Brown was killed by police officers in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. 
His death and the images of him laying in the street helped spark a movement around police accountability and justice for Black Americans. In this photo, Angel, that's the girl in the photo, is standing on the street where Mike Brown was shot and killed, and his sister Trinity actually took the photo. In an interview I did with them last year, they both expressed how while they were grateful for all the community and the support that came out to advocate for Mike, they wish they didn't have to see those images of him laying on the ground constantly. In the interview, they, they talk about how they wish their family could have had more control over which image images were shared with the world and how. So as human rights advocates, this is something that we should always be thinking about. And when filming and sharing footage in an indigenous context, it's important to think about how future generations will be viewing this footage and to take into account different tribal considerations as well. Before you share a video, it's helpful to ask yourself these questions first. They can help you determine what the best, safest next step is. And remember that you never have to consider these questions on your own. On your own. Always try to consult with an advocacy organization or a trusted friend or lawyer or journalist. So I'm not gonna go into detail for each of these questions, but I'm gonna hit on a couple of the important ones. When should I share my video? So timing is crucial. Timing can be the difference between your video making an impact and your video not making an impact. This still image is from a video that a bystander named Faden Santana took of Walter Scott, who was shot by a police officer eight times in the back in North Carolina. Faden happened to be walking by and filmed the incident on his cell phone. The video that he filmed shows the police officer planting a taser next to Walter Scott's body on the ground after he'd been shot. It also clearly shows that Walter Scott was shot while running away. So after filming this incident, the first thing Faden did was try to get in touch with Walter Scott's family. And he was actually able to connect with a family member through a mutual friend on Facebook from a local Black Lives Matter chapter. He worked with the family's lawyer and a journalist to determine how and when to publish the video. Three days after the official police report was filed that claimed Walter Scott had tried to take the police officer's taser and that the police officer shot him in self-defense, Faden's video was published on the homepage of the New York Times. The video revealed key inconsistencies and lies from the police statement. The day the video was released, the officer was charged with murder. And just this past December, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison for second degree murder. This is one of the rare police brutality cases in the US where, any sense, where there's any sense of judicial justice. So timing is really important and it's just one more reason why it can be helpful to wait before you share. Are there any identities I need to protect? Sharing videos publicly has the potential to re-traumatize someone or their family, as we saw with Mike Brown, or even make the target of, or even make them the target of retaliation by internet trolls or law enforcement. This can be especially true if the person in the footage has a high risk profile, if there's someone that police have already had contact with or they're undocumented. So it's important to remember that there's ways to protect people's identities after you film. YouTube offers a free blurring tool that allows you to blur multiple faces at a time. It's super easy to use and it's free. The link on this slide is for a tutorial that Witness created that will help you get started. And remember that identity can be more than just a person's face. It can be a tattoo or a symbol on their shirt linking them to an organization, a license plate address, etc. So another creative way to protect someone's identity while filming is by using a lens or filter. This is a still image from a video taken by Youssef Omar, who is a journalist who primarily uses his cell phone to tell stories. He was an editor at the Hindustan Times in India when he was invited to interview young women who had survived sexual abuse. Instead of interviewing and filming them on camera, Yusuf allowed the young women to use Snapchat lenses that filtered their faces and their voices. He also let them film themselves using, using his Snapchat account so that they'd be able, able to tell their stories while feeling safe. Do I want my name associated with the video? So this is a picture of Ramsey Orta, who, as I said earlier, filmed his friend Eric Garner being killed by Staten Island police. He ended up releasing the footage with the New York Daily News, which was shared all over the world. And Eric Garner, his last words, his life, became another spark for the Black Lives Matter movement and movement for police accountability here in the United States. Ramsey released the footage with the New York Daily News with his name attached to the article. And after the footage went viral, he became heavily targeted and surveilled by police, both he and his mother. He ended up getting arrested on quote unquote unrelated charges. 
and, and is now actually the only person from the scene of that crime who is serving any prison time. He's since said that if he could do it again, he would have released the footage with the New York Daily News anonymously. So it's important to know that you do have the option to, to share footage in a way that keeps your identity protected, especially in a situation like Ramsey's, where he had already been, the target, been a target by police because of his activism and the color of his skin. It's really important to understand that the footage that we share on YouTube and Facebook and other social media sites are not guaranteed to stay up there forever. Do not think of social media platforms as archives because they aren't and it's unsafe to think of them that way. We've worked with hundreds of activists around the world who have had valuable footage, footage of war crimes from Syria even, taken down and lost forever because YouTube flagged it as extremist content. So if you have filmed valuable footage, it's important to save it in a secure and safe way. And you can use this handy 321 rule to guide you. Keep three unedited copies of the footage. Use two types of storage. This can mean two different hard drives or one hard drive and a computer folder. Keep one offsite copy. So if you have two copies at your apartment, keep the third copy elsewhere, maybe your office or a fellow organizer's home. As I mentioned earlier, you never want to edit the original footage, not even the file name. Keep it exactly as it was captured on your phone or your device. If you do want to add more info to help yourself stay organized, you can include a text file in the folder where you save the footage that has more information like the time and date and description. But never edit the file itself, not even the name of it. As I mentioned earlier, this becomes really important if you're trying to use the footage for evidentiary purposes. If the file is edited, you might not, it might not be admissible as evidence. So we're almost ready for Q&A, but we wanted to end with a few basic mobile filming equipment recommendations to get you started. So having good audio is crucial, especially if you're conducting an interview, and especially if you're filming on your phone. Most smartphones have something called an omnidirectional mic, which means that your phone is picking up sound from all directions, which is great for talking on the phone, but not for an interview, because when you're filming, your phone, your phone is gonna be picking up all sorts of background noise. So here are a few examples of mics that you can buy that plug right into your phone. The one on the top left and bottom right can be used for both interviews and just to pick up better sound at whatever situation you're in. And the mics on the top right and bottom left are called lavalier mics. I'm sure you've seen these before if you've ever done an interview. These have a long wire and then a clip for the mic so you can clip it on directly to someone's shirt or collar. These are great for interviews. I've used really cheap ones before that I bought used on Amazon for less than $10 and they work just fine. But here are some um, ones that Witness recommends. And if you don't have access to a mic or a quiet space and you need to film an interview, a great filming hack that our partners in Brazil shared with us, this is actually a picture from Brazil, is that you can use the mic on your headphones to amplify sound. Many headphones these days comes with a mic so that you can utilize the hands-free functionality of a phone while you're driving or walking. You can actually use the mic on your headphones to optimize sound in an interview as well. So as you can see in the picture, the interviewee has one earbud in her ear, the mic on the headphones is dangling near her mouth, and then the headphones are plugged into the camera as it films. You could also just tape the mic from the headphones onto the interviewee's shirt. Just remember to plug it into the phone while it films. I've tried this before and it works really, really well. It's a really great hack. And then last, I wanted to share a few mobile editing apps that we use at Witness a lot and recommend to our partners. They're all super user-friendly and great options that can be used on multiple types of platform, um, multiple types of smartphones. I personally like KineMaster the best. Um, so we're ready for our Q&A now. I'm gonna hand it back to my colleague, Jackie. Thank you guys very much. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much for that, Polly. Um, so, as she mentioned, we now have just a couple minutes for some questions or comments. It doesn't look like anything has come in yet, um, but please feel free to send those through. In the meantime, I'm just going to point you to uh, one of our websites where you can find a lot of the resources that Polly mentioned, um, really practical tips on how to film the police, how to film for evidence, um, as well as our advocacy resources, and those are all available at library witness.org um, and so it looks like we have one question and thank you for that Jesse um, the question is are there times when it might not be appropriate to film um, 
And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Um, so as Polly mentioned, there's usually the main reasons we would say it's not appropriate to film would be if there's safety or security considerations. If someone is at risk or um, being targeted or if, if filming might expose their location or any sensitive identification details, then you might not want to film or you might want to ask explicitly for their permission before you start filming. Um, you also want to assess the risk to yourself. Are you in a situation that you can get out of? Do you have someone to call for backup and support? Um, or is, are, is it likely that your device could be confiscated? Um, these are all things you want to ask yourself before you even hit record. Anything you would add to that, Polly? No, I would just note that, uh, like I said in the presentation, if your phone's not already out and in your hand, um, we don't recommend reaching into your pocket or making any sudden movements to grab your phone in order to film, especially if you're surrounded by law enforcement or police. Um, any kind of sudden movements could escalate the situation or escalate any sort of violence. So you want to you wanna always be thinking about your safety and security and assessing your own personal comfort level as well. And just remember that if you don't film, there's still ways to document after the incident is over, after perpetrators have left, and written documentation is really important as well. So you don't have to always film, especially if you're feeling uncomfortable. Thank you, yes. And another great question here, um, what do I do if approached by police or security forces and they ask for my footage or for me to stop filming? Um, and again, I just wanna mention that the legal advice are not legal advice but the legal tips that we're giving here are specific to the u.s if you're not based in the u.s you should definitely look up information specific to where you're located um, but here in the u.s and i would assume everywhere else if the police tell you to back up you do need to back up um, we do have the right to film law enforcement but you also have to comply with orders um, one thing that we've heard to be a useful tactic is if you are backing up, sometimes they'll say you're not backing up far enough or you're not backing up. So it can be useful to point your camera down and film your feet as you take steps backwards. You can even say out loud, I'm backing up so that there's clear documentation that you have complied with orders. Um, and, and that can be a really useful tactic. If they ask to search your device, um, this gets complicated when you're on the border or traveling, but you do not have to consent to a search. Um, this is also why it's important to have a password protected phone so that they can't just automatically go in and do that search. There are some situations where your device could be confiscated for evidence. Um, but in that case, again, having a password on your phone is really, really important so that it can't just be broken into. Um, anything you would add to that, Polly? No. All right, and we've just got time for one last question here. Um, in the Hubo Wahin case, were there any safety considerations for locals appearing in the video, like threats coming from mining interests? If there is such context, what was a suitable way to approach the video as a tool? That is a great question. Thank you for that. We hear a lot about threats and violence against um, environmental rights defenders, so this is a very serious concern. Um, I did not work specifically on this case, but I can check with my colleague. Um, but in terms of how you would approach a video like that, you would want to have a conversation with that community or that group before you start filming anything to not only identify what the risks are, but really talk through hypothetical situations that people might not be thinking of automatically. Like, thinking about where this video will be shown. If it's shown online and you upload the video, you're probably gonna lose control of it and people could remix it or take it out of context. It's important to talk through all of those specific points before you produce the video so that everyone's clear on what the risks are and then how you might be able to mitigate them. In some cases, people might choose not to appear in the video or just be behind the scenes. Um, so I want to wrap it up so that we stay on time and thank everybody for participating in, the, in this webinar. And um, we have really enjoyed putting it together. And again, would love to hear your feedback and how this um, information is useful in your work and if there's other things that you would love to learn. Um, thank you so much, Sandra, for helping us organize this. Um, 
If you do have any additional questions, uh, we've got our email addresses here, or again, you can send that to feedback at witness.org. We're happy to continue answering questions. Once this ends, you won't be able to enter them in the chat box, so you will need to use our emails. Um, so yes, thank you again, Sandra. Thank you, Polly, um, for doing this, especially while you're sick. Um, and thanks to everybody here who helped make this happen. And we hope you all have a great afternoon, evening, or morning, wherever you are. Bye. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you.